Good evening, everyone. I am Janie Winchell. I'm the Sarah Fraser Robbins Director of the Dottie Brown Art and Nature Center here at PAM and curate the natural history collections for the museum. More recently, I've also been spearheading the museum's new climate and environment initiative. Climate Action, Inspiring Change is the anchor exhibition for this initiative and served as the inspiration for tonight's special event, Speaking from the Heart and Open Dialogue on Climate Action. I'd like to thank the Lowell Institute for their vital support for this program and Rare as our co-host and all of you for joining us tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to respectfully recognize and acknowledge that PAM is on the ancestral, traditional, and current lands of the Pawtucket, Penacook, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag. Many other indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of generations. And indigenous people of many nations live and work in our region today. Please join us in honoring their communities, their elders, past, and present, as well as future generations. And to start our program tonight, I'd like to invite Jordan Sanchez <clears throat> to join me on the screen. Jordan Sanchez, a junior at Harvard University, is also a spoken word poet and activist. Sanchez is dedicated to leaving the world better than she found it. Her commissioned work includes performing for the 2021 World Environment Day, launching the decade of restoration, among many other honors. The poem she will be sharing with us in a moment, Reimagine, Recreate, Restore, is also featured in our Climate Action Exhibition. So welcome, Jordan. I am so looking forward to hearing your wonderful voice. Have you ever seen time fly? Watch it slip through your fingers like a cloud passing by. Too slow to notice it leaving, too fast to make it stop. All we've known is to destroy like it's breathing. The pitter patter of raindrops match the sounds of clocks counting down tick, tick, tick. How lucky we are to live. We are a fraction of a second in Earth's lifetime, yet she is our only lifeline. Resilient, we stand on our own two feet. I'll tell you, reimagining the future has never tasted so sweet. Like nectar to a bee, honey to a home. We're trying to recover ours, but no one can do this alone. Tick, tick, tick. The promise of restoration lives within us. We see her in the hues of the youth, and she's asking you, what will you stand for? Now is the time for our regeneration. Reimagine, recreate, restore. Thank you so much for that, Jordan, and for bringing forth uh, the intended spirit of this event so beautifully. Um, and, and that reminder of Earth being our lifeline. Um, and to set the stage for the climate conversation, I wanted to mention that the Climate Action Exhibition was inspired by young leaders like Jordan in the youth climate movement. The show focuses on known solutions and how we can transform this crisis into hope for our shared future, which our panelists will be touching on each in their own way. Each of our panelists will take a few minutes to share their particular perspectives and the core issues that they care about most. I'm briefly going to introduce each of them up front so we can move smoothly from one panelist to the next before opening up to a general conversation among the group, followed by a Q&A with all of you. So start thinking about what you'd like to ask and add your question or comment using the QA tab, if you would. Our first presenter, Miranda Massey, has been a partner and vital advisor on the Climate Action Show. Miranda is the founding director of the Climate Museum, 
the first museum in the nation to focus exclusively on climate. In 2014, she left a career in social justice law to lay the groundwork for the museum. In addition to her work with PEM, Miranda has collaborated with universities and museums, including Columbia, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, and Rio's Museum of Tomorrow, among many others. Next up will be Kevin Green, who leads RARE's Center for Behavior and Environment, a team scientist, a team of scientists, designers, and trainers bringing insight from behavioral science to bear on critical environmental issues. Kevin regularly speaks about the intersection of human behavior and climate change and how our understanding of behavior can help spark individual action into large scale change. Jordan Sanchez, who I already introduced and you now get to have heard and seen her poetry in person, will follow Kevin. Then comes Natalia Jacobs, now a freshman at Bates College. In 2022, Natalia was part of Mass Audubon's Youth Climate Leaders Program, which is also featured in Penn's Climate Action Exhibition, and took part in planning the Western Math Mass Youth, Youth Climate Summit. She was also a member of Youth Climate Action Now and collaborated on the American Repertory Theater production of Wild. Last up will be Noella Altvader, who grew up on the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Sepayak and is a student at Washington County Community College. Noella is a 2022 Brookie Awards recipient and has represented her work at University of Maine's Sustainability and Water Conference. Through story mapping, Noella has woven together images, scientific data, social statistics, and personal stories into compelling research that gives voice to the needs of local communities. First, welcome to all of you. I'm so delighted to share this moment and this evening with you. And uh, Miranda, I'd love for you to kick us off. I'm so honored and delighted to do that, Janie. I wanna thank you for including me in this tremendously meaningful and special event. And you've asked us to share what matters to us personally. And for me and my work at the Climate Museum, one of the things that matters the very most is encouraging people who are concerned about the climate crisis, but haven't yet leaned into taking civic action to understand themselves as true climate protagonists. And we have a show up right now that helps explain that a little more concretely. So as you know, I've prepared some slides since the work I do is quite visual. Um, uh, and I'll ask our colleague, Corey, to run through them quickly. This is our first transit accessible pop-up. It's in Manhattan. It's very important for us to be socially inclusive and accessible to all. Admission is always free. So it's really, really a great feeling to open up a open up a space for exhibition and climate connection and community that was subway accessible in New York City. Next slide, please, Corey. I want to first talk about how meaningful it was to work with you, Janie, and your incredible team on climate action, inspiring change, which as you say, was, was inspired by uh, the youth climate movement um, and the ways in which it teaches us that change is possible, necessary, and lies ahead. And now Corey taking us back to Manhattan, this is just a quick interior view of the exhibition space that we've set up to give you a, a feeling um, for what the space looks like. Next slide. We start with art. In this case, a significant new work of climate art by the muralist David Opdyke, who constructs murals out of Americana postcards to give us a view of a dystopian potential future 
that's so beautiful and so full of wit and humor and unexpected details that it opens us up to new feelings rather than shutting us down. It's a future we can avoid. And because of the creativity in the piece, we feel expansive, not shut down. Next slide, please, Corey. We've held incredible dialogues on subjects such as climate reparations. Here's the philosopher and reparations expert, Olafemi Taiwo, delivering a beautiful talk. We've encouraged, next slide, please. Thousands of regular people to write postcards to their elected representatives. These are the postcards that are um, in the work of art, they're replicas of those postcards. And that relationality has inspired people um, to write, as I said, thousands of postcards expressing concern about the climate crisis and requesting action. Next slide, please. People are recording messages about their feelings and thoughts about climate and what we can do together in their sense of empowerment upon learning that they're part of a climate supermajority, a subject we'll be getting into further into the, into the program. Next slide. We like to scaffold out specific examples of actions that people can take that are public facing and civic without limiting anyone to a series of checkmark boxes. There's always a new way to be a climate protagonist that's particular to you. Next slide. And here you'll see some of the thousands of climate commitments that people have taken, have made in the space, um, embodied by stickers so that we can see individual civic action commitments become collective. Um, some of these actions are actually taken in the show itself. And finally, last slide. One of our visitors, someone unknown to us, explaining this sense of community of possibility when we come together with the will to build brighter futures is what we need. This is what moves me and I look forward to discussing it more. I think, I think my that's my- sincere, My sincere apologies, Kevin, that is your cue. No, no problem. Thank you, uh, Miranda and Janie. Um, it's an it's an honor to to be here with such an illustrious group. Uh, so I appreciate being included. Um, I'm going to share uh, for just a minute, sort of the perspective that I'm um, coming from to this question. So um, I have the the privilege of working with a team of social and behavioral scientists at Rare, where really all of our work is animated by um, a, a pretty simple question, which is, you know, why is it that crises like like climate change are um, accelerating despite the fact that they're, you know, killing us as a species and despite really all sorts of progress in, in technology and policy and finance to, to theoretically slow these, these crises. And for those of us on the rare team, the answer is um, both simple and complicated. It's, it's because solving these challenges, you know, ultimately depends on, on people. And yet we've, we've fundamentally as a movement um, misunderstood how how complicated people are. Um, you know, humans are are perhaps the best problem solving species that that ever lived. Unfortunately, just not a problem like climate change. Uh, we we like problems that feel close, that feel urgent, that feel really personal. You know, think of the sort of threats that our early ancestors faced, and, and that our species then adapted to cope well with. And climate change, um, although this is changing, can feel like like none of these things. It's kind of distant. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to connect cause and effect, and it's it's hard to really feel like like in the grand scheme of things, you know, that I can do anything to affect any change. Um, and of course, we can't change the nature of the human species overnight. So our job at Rare is to to use the tools of behavioral and social science um, to help make climate change more like the sort of problems people are good at solving. Things like pushing past the the doom and gloom and and making it feel possible. Um, uh, museums are another amazing you know, way to accomplish these goals. You know, you've got a lot of people that Miranda referred to, um, you know, particularly young people, but really everybody that are you know, very, very concerned about, about climate change. You know, that, the, the idea that's not true is kind of past now. You know, and, and they're hearing a lot about how it's the product of a, of a system over which they have no control. 
which is both counterproductive and untrue. It's popular in, in some circles to say that your, your behavior doesn't matter. There's, there's nothing much you can do to save our species from the impending crisis and the system is too big for you to make a difference. And um, our team thinks this is a pretty myopic viewpoint. Of course, we need large scale system wide solutions and massive policy change to support them. But to say that I personally have no role in that as an individual, aside from voting and, and protesting, both of which are important, sets up a false choice. Um, ultimately, the system is made up of individuals whose daily decisions do matter. Um, and that really comes down to three reasons that I'll share with you very quickly. You know, first, as I said, you, you just objectively, the data, you know, show your emissions, my emissions, they do matter. Uh, Rare has modeled the most impactful behaviors to identify where's the biggest opportunity for individual impact. And you can learn more about those at, at rare.org or specifically if you're in the Boston area, check out rare.org um, backslash um, uh, Boston. But I'm here to tell you that um, the behavior of, of you and the people around you, the choices that you make in, in your daily life uh, do make a difference. The second reason has to do with what we sometimes call the, the snowball effect. Um, when you adopt uh, solar or you opt for an, an electric vehicle instead of an internal combustion engine, or maybe you make a conscious choice to rely a bit less on meat for your protein, you start to evaluate other decisions in your life through the same lens. So you get a sort of snowball effect in your decision making that leads to other climate friendly uh, behaviors. But even more, more so, this third one is the really great one. You start to influence those around you. And this is the most important point. Humans are an incredibly social species. Uh, we tend to model our behavior after our peers. We call this social influence. And we know, for instance, that one of the strongest predictors of whether or not someone has solar panels on their roof, uh, more so than their age or their income or their race or their education, is whether or not their neighbors have them. Uh, and our research at Rare has borne this, this same finding out repeatedly, you know, much more so than these other factors, and even than political orientation, which surprises a lot of people, your willingness to adopt a climate friendly behavior is predicted by the extent to which you think others in your reference network, your friends and peers, uh, are doing or thinking the same thing. Uh, and we also find repeatedly that, that people systematically underestimate the extent to which their peers think something should be done uh, about climate change. So there's a huge opportunity space in overcoming this social expectations gap. So all this adds up to, to an opportunity to develop climate solutions and communicate about climate change in a way that appeals to emotions, uh, leverages social influences, and generally understands the, the complicated nature with which people are coming to the climate crisis, rather than wishing we, we as a species were something different. Uh, and the great news is that these tools exist, we just need to get them into more hands uh, of those concerned about this crisis. So I'll leave it there for now and um, have the especially great honor of handing it back to Jordan uh, for her remarks. So over to you, Jordan. Yeah, thank you so much. Obviously, huge fan of Rare, feel a part of the family always. Um, but I, I'm Gen Z, I'm a part of the generation that was grown up totally to being told to reduce, reuse, recycle, we were doing lots of little plant experiments in my elementary school classrooms. Um, I remember movies, animated movies from Disney featuring animals that later went extinct a couple years later. That's the kind of environment that I was exposed to um, growing up when it comes to climate change and just environmentalism as a whole. But none of those things made me care about climate change. Why I care about climate change is just people. You know, all of this, I think, comes down to that, whether it's my grandmother who lives in Puerto Rico or whether it's my friends who have family in Bangladesh who are very at risk of some of the consequences of climate change. And me, obviously, being a writer, being a poet, I feel my unique responsibility is to remind people of that simple fact that caring about the world, caring about climate change really is just caring about people and not just someone you've never met, but really the people across the street, those in your classrooms, and of course, yourself and your family as well. Um, so I feel like that's kind of what I focus on, whether it's through my poetry or through the column that I've had at the Harvard Crimson this past semester called the Everyday Environmentalist. I really like to, I guess, distill those fears and those nerves of that I think a lot of people, both young people like me who are very 
interested and excited to take action, but also those who are a little bit more on the fence, who are aware and are concerned, but don't even know where to start. Just kind of worrying that, you know, if I can't do everything right, if I can't do everything perfectly, what's the point of doing anything at all? Um, and just reminding people that you do have power as an individual, like this is your world too, and that you do have power to change it. And then of course, looking at it from a college student perspective, you know, college is a very unique time when people are not only expecting change, but are extremely open to it. So what kind of changes and habits can we instill in our college students so that when they're graduates, when they're adults, when they're starting their own families and creating their own neighborhoods, they're able to kind of share those habits and those beliefs with everyone around them. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and what I'm excited to share and discuss. And of course, pass it on to Natalia. Hi everyone, um, I'm Natalia. First of all, I would just love to echo all the beautiful sentiments um, already said here today. Um, so when asked sort of why I wanna do action against climate change and why I care about this work, it's sort of a silly and simple answer. Um, but the first thing that comes to my head is I really like snow days and that sense of waking up and all of a sudden school's canceled and you can go play outside with your friends. Um, and it seems like a, a small, simple thing, but um, I realize it's a moment um, that, that I really care about. And um, more often I've been looking around and finding these moments um, and just how nature is so, is my community, is my home. Um, like Jordan said, is the people I love and care about and um, sort of finding that as inspiration to take action. Um, I was definitely one of those people. I wish I had grown up with more of a rare or an event like this that is so solutions based. I was definitely someone who got more bogged down sort of in the doom and gloom. Um, and as I was so fortunate to be able to find um, this amazing program run by Hitchcock Center and Mass Audubon Society um, called the Western Mass Youth Climate Summit. Um, and that has really shown me the power of being in a group of um, people who all care about passionately about something, um, but don't let fear necessarily be the predominant emotion, but let there be joy and let it be fun. Um, and that's something that has really inspired me to move forward. And I'm so excited to be able to learn more about ways we can take action um, while also making sure we're taking care of ourselves and the things we love. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Noella. Hi, I'm Noella. I also want to say thank you to everybody that has already spoke. It's very, very nice to hear from all of you guys and what you have to say. I also believe that climate change is a very, very big thing and it's very important to focus on and take care of on Earth. A little bit of the background of how I grew up. I grew up on a very small reservation for most of my life. I moved away for a couple of years and then I ended up coming back as a teenager and now I live here full time and I plan to stay here probably for a couple more years before I decide to go anywhere else. I'm very much so still invested in my community. A part of that actually has to do with topic today, climate change. Um, a lot of the work I do surrounds water and water is a very, very big and important thing in all elements of life. It grows just about anything that we have and it keeps us alive and it's very, very, very important to take care of the water and the earth. And that brings me to why climate change is so important to me because without a clean, safe earth for people to live on, what are we able to do that's actually good for ourselves? If we're not taking care of the earth, are we taking care of ourselves? And a very, very big concept for me is nature gives back to you. If you take care of nature, nature will in turn take care of you. And growing up in an indigenous background, nature and culture are hand in hand you treat nature and mother earth as if it is one, as if, as if it's pure and medicinal and healing. And when I see climate change conversation and things like that, I see a lot of people ask, why is it important? Well, it's important because it gives us life. 
the climate change that we're drastically seeing and the climate change that we're in turn suffering from, such as drought, have really affected what life will look like long term and what our animals will look like long term and what our food will look like long term and what our ability to take care of ourselves will look like long term. Climate change is at the base of all of these things. And so it is very important discussion to be having. And that is why I'm very, very, very excited to be here today to have that conversation and speak my piece and listen to what everybody else has to say on, on a very important subject as well. I believe I'm the last one. So I don't think I pass it to anybody that's right, Noella, you are you are wrapping it up and did such a beautiful job doing so. Um, I really appreciated all of the messages that you shared and 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 the individuality of where you're coming from really came through for for me with each of your messages. And I feel like that's so important uh, to the conversation because um, it, it is about people coming from where they're at and, and the things that matter to them. Um, and I really wanted to start first by acknowledging the fact that for many people, they don't really talk about climate issues. And I was curious for each of you, uh, how do you start conversations with people about the climate? Like, what do you find works um, that doesn't alienate people, that engages people. Um, so uh, is there one of you that would like to start with that as, a, as an idea? Yeah, Natalia. Um, so yeah, this is such a great question and one I've been thinking about a lot. Um, it's funny, there's days like when I like don't want to have a conversation about climate and sort of assessing why that is. And when these conversations do occur, what personally draws me to them and makes me feel engaged. Um, and one thing I've discovered more and more, um, the a negative side of uh, the climate crisis can be that it's interconnected to every aspect of our life. Um, but I find that can also be a positive where um, often you can have a subject with whoever you're engaging in a conversation with. Um, they have something that they care about that may not at all seem related, but that maybe you can find a common ground, whether that be, I don't know, even something like roads and potholes or basic infrastructure or like heating and cooling. Um, and so I find finding the other person's what they care about and what you care about and sort of finding an intersectionality um, within that and having more of a solution focused dialogue. So not only are we addressing the, um, the problem and definitely making space for all the feelings and emotions that come with that and processing that, um, but also making sure that we're, uh, that there is a purpose to this conversation to set up ways um, to solve it. I love that the relationship to intersectionality that's there as a as a starting point for engaging someone. Um, others of you that would like to jump in on that idea, what you do, what what you've seen that's worked, Jordan? Yeah, I'd have to say, obviously, mine is a little bit different just because I am a poet. So most of the time when I'm initiating a conversation with someone, I'm speaking for a couple of minutes and it's something memorized that I've written like several months ago. Um, so it's a little bit different than your typical conversation, but whenever I am writing, because to me, that's what it is, it's an introduction to other people's climate justice. And I always try to keep that at the center of my mind and the center of my writing process. It's just keeping everything extremely grounded, extremely relatable. Like Natalia with snow days for me personally, I love like, I love going to the beach. I love the sand. Like I love coastal kind of like towns. Um, and those simply just won't exist anymore um, if climate change is, if climate change just continues at the crazy pace that it is. Um, so just one, rem remembering to make it personal to me, remembering to make it personal to other people as well. And then also, of course, keeping that hopeful attitude like Natalia mentioned. It's important to be solution oriented because it is so easy to get 
super doom and gloom about it. And I think that's part of the reason why some people don't talk about it at all, that they're just extremely, I guess, it brings a sense of anxiety and a defeat as well that they've already lost the battle. So I even try, but no, we have it. Like the battle is still ongoing, of course. And it's I always something I always like to say is that you can always choose when you want to start over. And me performing, every time I perform, I like to see it as a form of starting over, both for myself, but also for everyone in the audience, everyone who's listening, because we can always kind of take the chance and be like, you know what, even if I'm not doing everything perfectly, what's something I can commit to today? What's something I can do tomorrow? What's something I can get my friends or my siblings, or my parents to adopt in the next couple of weeks so that there is some kind of ripple effect? Because of course, something is better than nothing. So true, so true. And I love how you reference the fact that your poem is a personal communication with someone. So it's an invitation to engage in the conversation with you, whether they're talking or not, but that sense of connecting is uh, wonderful. Others of you, this is uh, rich content. Yeah, Miranda. I love what both of you have said. I, I think that's, often part of how I'll start a com climate conversation as, as well as something very much um, in, in a vein that's similar to, to, to what you guys just articulated. I'll throw out a third technique that I use and one that might sound a little more abstract, but I feel it's very important and it connects to something that Kevin said earlier as well. Um, there's a super majority in the US for transformational climate action it's a bipartisan supermajority um, that supports a Green New Deal, that supports federal payments to the communities of color and low-income white communities that have been used as sacrifice zones for fossil fuel expansion. It's more than 65% across the board. And in every state, there is a ubiquitous perception that instead of being a two-thirds majority, we're a one-third minority. And that makes us feel outscaled and isolated and alone and like what we say and do doesn't matter. This has been known for a long time, the two-thirds supermajority. What was recently discovered sometime late last summer by some social science researchers is that we all underestimate support for transformational climate action at scale by half. And that second piece of the research makes it very actionable and very empowering. So another, another way that I'll sometimes approach a climate conversation, depending on who I'm talking to, the situation, what I've gathered about who they are and what their, their resistance might be, is through the fact that we're not alone in caring about this, that there's a massive wave of support for climate action in the United States that has not yet been expressed because we don't yet have the shift in social norms as relates to consumption, Kevin, and also as relates to self-expression and political and civic activity. That cultural shift can happen. We just have to understand ourselves to be in a majority. So that's that's um, that's a third a third tool that I'll add into the the kit that we're building together. Excellent points. Um, May I, may I super briefly ch chime in and, and add Please. to that? Um, uh, great point from from Miranda. The, the 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 research that she's talking about is on a phenomenon that has a wonky name called pluralistic ignorance. Um, and it's what what is also true about what she said, or also important about what she said, is that therefore um, talking about um, climate action is how you overcome that. And so. Um, just by initiating those conversations, you are becoming part of the solution because you're signaling to those around you um, that what they think about what you want to talk about isn't isn't true. So um, it's a really important um, insight. Uh, the other thing I just want to quickly say on this question is um, uh, maybe in some circles a kind of radical thing to say, um, but I think here not so much. Um, you know, taking on the climate crisis is serious and scary, uh, but it can also be fun and something we can look forward to. I mean, I just loved the honesty and humor with which Natalia just said, I, I just really like snow days. Um, and 
that's a much more enjoyable way to talk about you know this issue than a lot of what what we do and um it can make it a lot you know easier to to talk about with one another fabulous yeah thank you for all of that and noella is there anything you wanted to add from your perspective mm, my perspective on kind of opening a conversation and talking amongst people yeah. has a lot to do with the energy that people are giving me are they engaged in the conversation are they interested in talking to me or do they kind of just want to get straight to the facts and they just want to know what's being talked about and they want to get it over with a lot of that time comes in happenings of interviews I've seen I've done a couple different interviews where I often see people kind of just they rush to the information rush to the important part instead of you know the backstory and why people are there for what they're doing, which is probably the most important part to me is the nature of why this is even important to you. Um, I'm not much of a talker, honestly, socially. I, I don't do well with that approaching people. Often I let people approach me. So that's the first thing that I usually do is kind of look around the room and see who's open and like okay they're they're looking back at me they're kind of open no one's near them maybe that would be a safe option i kind of get a little bit closer make maybe small talk about the event if you're at an event uh like i said i'm kind of awkward a little bit so i you know shuffle my way in there a little bit in common things that they're around me anything that i can really throw off the top of my head um, usually I try to be pretty light and airy and just, I don't like to talk about anything that can kind of upset conversation. Just keep it very open and not minimalistic, but, um, I don't know what a good word for it exactly would be just very friendly and quaint. And yeah, that's all I really got. Like I said, I'm not much of a, I'm not much of a talker, but I do, I do a lot more approachable things through like presenting. I'm very good at speaking. Like if I have something set out or a speech, I can do something very well with that. It's usually how I communicate to people. My guess is though, that there's a way that you are Noella that creates an, that it's creates an accessibility for other people. Um, because I think it's one of the hazards that those of us are very engaged in this uh, for whoever we're talking to, to feel like we're coming at them. And mm -hmm. so I feel like the point you brought up is, is really important in the messaging that I've been exposed to anyway of um, allowing for people to have their own perspective on this and, and, and honoring that, which it sounds like you're referencing that um, and we're obviously going to have our view, but we don't want that to be um, dominating theirs or feeling like they're um, they're not being appreciated for their own perspective. So um, thank I really appreciated all of your perspectives on that topic because it um, there's so much research out there that indicates that the number one most important thing for us to do right now is talk about this issue. And especially from the perspective of what are the things that can be done and that we can use to leverage um, to create a different outcome of where than where we might be headed otherwise. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, but on the same vein, like, what do you think is missing from uh, the climate conversation, the ones that are happening that are out there? You've touched on some of it, but if there was things you wanted, any of you wanted to add uh, that you think is um, important for how we move forward um, and, and how we are inclusive in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a community, as a society, um, Thoughts on that? Yeah, Noella. Um, I think one really easy and simple way to kind of get everybody involved 
is your children, kids, youth. Um, a lot of the things you see day to day based or community like community events could be very very helpful. And you could do things in schools and allow uh, public events and kind of just little things here and there for people to feel included. And I feel that children have a different aspect to the conversation. They're a little more lighthearted. They bring a little bit more joy to the topic and fun. And it kind of just brings back the childhood memory of, you know, happiness and being together and things like that. So I think a good start would maybe be to bring some cute little kids around. It's a great way to open a channel to other generations. If, uh, yeah, if kids are enlivened about it, um, we know that that can travel upward to, to their, the generations above them. Um, other, other thoughts on what, what might be missing? I think adding on to that and sort of like children's perspective um, and sort of wonder at the world, maybe incorporating that more into the way we approach this problem. Mm -hmm. um, I know messaging is even something I struggle with um, that uh, and climate messaging, and I do it too. I feel like sometimes uh, since it feels like an issue that is, is on such a time frame um, and is so vast that there can be a now, 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 um, and that we sort of assert that by putting a lot on people all at once and sort of bombarding or um, putting that on ourselves. And uh, that can definitely be a, a indicator of like having others shut down from conversations or even ourselves. Um, and so trying to approach it more from like a sense of wonderment and finding that joy, um, even just like I was talking to someone who was younger than me about like a a technology for uh, microplastics. And they were like, that's something out of a Marvel movie. And I was like bogged down in the science. And I was like, you know what? That is something that sounds super cool and like out of a Marvel movie. Um, and that like this science can actually be really cool and um, sort of uh, approaching and creating our messaging in a way that is inviting and encouraging to people. Um, Cause I think like people have said, a lot of people are very much aware of the problem now. Um, but we never really lead with there's a solution to this and uh, not so much looking at what we have to lose, which is definitely so important, but also looking like what we have to gain um, by creating systems that don't harm us, but foster us. Fantastic. Yeah, Miranda. Yeah, I'm picking up on, on your beautiful remarks, Noel and Natalia and, and um, adding a kind of a, a adjacent element of the kind of connection and fulfillment that we can feel in working together to address this un unbelievably profound existential crisis. We don't have to look away from the hard truth. In fact, it's really important to see that truth clearly and to name it. But in doing that together and in joining with each other, we build a sense of community that's profoundly enriching and meaningful and brings tremendous emotional joy. So I would not say that conversations about human emotions or about the social and community connections that are involved in the climate crisis as we move forward together to confront it are fully missing, Janie, but I don't think that they're um, forward enough. I think we could spend much more time talking about them um, than we do about some other aspects of climate solutions. And we had a, there was a 10 year old girl, for example, speaking of, of children and that sense of intergenerational care that can be so critically motivating, um, who insisted on having her birthday party at the Climate Museum a few days ago. So she brought all of her friends and her parents came and they brought their friends. Um, and it was an intergenerational climate solutions and climate activism party. And that's how she wanted to mark her 10th birthday. Um, and uh, cake, candles and all. Um, and uh, that moment of recognizing the passion that we can 
encourage in each other, the silence that we can break in each other um, and making it something that feels like the joy of being with other human beings who see us clearly is something we can think about and talk about more in these in these conversations. And one of the many reasons that I'm so grateful to be here with all of you, because I feel like that's what this conversation is all about. So true. That's uh that's such a great point of that. Um, the way that the the vision of that 10 year old welcoming all those people in uh, and that celebratory moment uh, with something that is um, such a critical a critical topic uh, is is really inspiring. Um, Kevin, I was curious if there's anything as I know this is an area of work that you are deeply involved in and dedicated to. I yes, but also I just I sort of feel like that those amazing three responses I just need to um, shut up and let them speak for themselves. I mean, I'm just nodding along you know, with everything that um, everyone just said. And you know, I don't know that I can add a lot to that. Something I wanted to kind of bring up related to almost the childlike wonder or just a new way of looking at things. I think a lot of times there's this pressure on all of us, like every single person would feel like they have to come up with a new solution. Like we have to figure out how to solve the problems. When like people have already solved these problems before. So it's a I think a lot of what's missing is just the sharing of these solutions. And to an extent, obviously there are great organizations like Ram the Climate Museum that are empowering people with actionable items and steps they can take to really make a difference in their own lives. Um, but just in a day-to-day -day when we're talking about people who aren't sitting in on these panels, um, a lot of them are just like, I don't know what to do and I don't even know where to start. I remember I was talking to some of actually my friends about what Dickinson College is doing. Like Dickinson College has really been like so incredible in terms of sustainability and how they, how they have every student take a class in climate change or sustainability. And just thinking about what that could look like on my own college campus, what that could look like in each university's campus. There are little things that I think we kind of take for granted, you know, when it comes to just like, for example, Harvard recently will do like renovations where it's like, okay, we have water bottle fillers. And now that's a part of everyone's day-to-day -day life. Now there are almost no plastic water bottles around and everyone carries their own refillable one and you decorate it with stickers. And it's like a huge part of like your culture and your identity. Um, and I, I was just thinking like, okay, there are ways that we can do this on a wider scale. Like thinking about community shared appliances instead of everyone and having their own in their individual dorm room. Like little solutions like that, that don't actually take much effort or energy or planning, but people just haven't even thought about what that could look like because we're so stuck in the solutions that we are exposed to on a day to day. Um, so kind of taking the time to learn from other institutions, other communities, um, other people who are able to kind of share and let us into their world and see what we can take and kind of adapt it for our own environments. And then something else I think is missing, especially in the not so everyday people like us, is just this element of self-forgiveness. Um, I think we put a lot of weight on ourselves and I will say this in every panel I'm invited to, that we all I think carry a lot of shame in how we just go about living our lives, even though a lot of us are doing as much as we can. I like to believe that everyone is doing as much as they can on any given day, um, but we still like feel shame, feel shame, feel embarrassed, feel like we're not doing enough, kind of almost like an imposter syndrome within this space or within advocacy as a whole, because maybe one day we'll get a stake and now it's like, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing I could have ever done in my entire life. But really it's not. I think no one can ever be truly perfect, but just, reminding ourselves that we don't have to attack ourselves. We don't have to be so mean and so harsh when we are doing what we can. So well put. And uh, um, the, and the first part of what you were saying too, Jordan, about what to me speaks to sort of a mindset, like we, um, we just get into our, our habits and, and habits can be very easily changed um, and then it's normalizing. 
Uh, so some of the some of these activities um, can, by rippling out, can really feel like, oh well, that's of course this is how we should do it. Um, so I want to uh, switch to asking about um, for each of you, uh, what makes you feel optimistic about our shared climate future? What what are you seeing that's um, motivating you uh, that's not fear-based, but that is um, coming from that positive place in each of you. Maybe I'll jump in and go first this time since I opted out of the last one and, and this way I don't have to, um, I don't have to follow these amazing <laughs> uh, responses. Um, I, I would say two things to this, um, Janie. One, I kind of already mentioned, which is just that humans are incredibly good at problem solving. Um, and in spite of uh, what you hear, um, we're unbelievably good at cooperating. We like to cooperate. We like to work together to solve problems. It's in our nature. Uh, so there's um, th there's something there inside us that that bodes well. Um, it's just you know <laughs> this is just a big one. Um, the second thing is you know we like to think of climate a lot as sort of an issue centered in politics, uh, and that is brutal. Um, because we know how, um, you know, stuck our political process can be. What makes me optimistic is that it doesn't take an act of Congress to change your behavior. Um, it can help uh, that things like the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, introduce incentives um, that make behavior change easier, but um, people have to take those incentives. People have to make choices with or without it. And um, we don't have to wait uh, for our policymakers to get their act together before we um, do the same for ourselves. Thanks for that, Kevin. Excellent points there. Others, you know, what makes you up feel optimistic? Every time I've asked this question, I have the same answer. So I just have to share, but it truly is this art created. Um, of course, my first exposure to that 100% due to Miranda with the Climate Speaks program back in 2019. Um, some of the coolest people I've ever met, but I remember sitting there, I remember the exact date, June 20 or June 14, 2019, sitting in the front row of the Apollo, watching my friends get up and perform some amazing, amazing work. On like the days that I feel so down, just about this crisis, but just about anything in the world that I feel I have no power in solving, I always look back to those poems. And those are my first source of motivation, of inspiration. And even to this day, I mean, even at the, the inspiring kind of change exhibit, walking around and seeing the art that young people have created and talking to some of the, just talking to everyone actually who was there seeing it, both artists themselves, also people who are just kind of curious and looking around and had questions about what they were seeing. Just, I don't know, seeing the art, seeing how people respond to it and knowing that something that a lot of people may see as useless is actually such a great and powerful tool when it comes to keeping people engaged and hopeful and inspired when regarding the climate crisis. Um, if no one else wants to add on to that, it, I think that's a great launch for the role of art, role of creativity um, moving forward uh, with something that you referenced, Miranda, um, of the success of your current exhibition and that it, it art felt like it was opening people up to look at this topic differently. So um, would be wonderful to hear both from those of you that are bringing art into your work and also uh, those that are seeing uh, your own experience with art. I'll take that one first, if, if that's all right with everybody else, uh, in part because I wanna pick up on what you said, Jordan, and talk about how that night, it was our first youth climate arts program at the Climate Museum and Jordan and 13 extraordinary colleagues of hers from across Metro NYC, um, many of whom were completely new to climate advocacy and or to poetry writing and or to performance at the start of the program. We had some people who had a trifecta of total inexperience. 
got up and held an audience of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in that unbelievably awe-inspiring space, that storied space wrapped in the palms of their hands. And you all touched collectively on every major human emotion. There was joy and optimism. There was distress and despair. There was fury and sarcasm. There was hope. There was everything you could imagine. There was nostalgia in one case, which is a very powerful thing for a um, a, a middle-aged person to see a young teenager expressing nostalgia about her youth. I don't know if you remember the poem I'm talking about, Jordan, but was a profound moment. The, in, the, the, the whole space was silent and just, as I said, wrapped. Um, and so the arts are built into how we experience ourselves as a collective and Kevin, to your point, collaborative species. So Jordan, what you're saying lands so strongly on all fours with me. Why else would there be paintings on the cave paintings on the walls of some of our first homes? We know that speech and song evolved together. Scholars debate which came first initially, but nobody disputes that they happened at the same time. There's a genetic mutation that differentiates us from our Neanderthal cousins. Um, that involves aesthetic appreciation. So when they made something beautiful, it was by accident. That's not true for us. Art is built into how we understand our own capacity as beings, both individually, our own agency, but also more importantly for the climate crisis, our collective capacity and our connectedness to each other, our care for each other. Um, and so for us, at the Climate Museum, where our role is very specifically to introduce people who are new to the climate conversation into seeing themselves as agents of change, um, using the arts is one of the pathways, and it can be arts on a range of different subjects, because as we've already touched on, the climate crisis is affecting almost everything important to humanity in one way or another. So there's a pathway in. If that pathway includes beauty and art and human creativity, even when the subject matter is hard, even with the poems, Jordan, that were difficult and upset on that stage at the Apollo, there's something in that act of creating around it that lets us know what we're capable of as individuals and again, most importantly, together. Um, and that is, that is why I'm overjoyed. There's so much art in climate action, inspiring change, um, and why it's such an important part of our theory of change at the Climate Museum. To be human is to relate to art. And to be human together is what we need to confront the climate crisis. Mm. Thank you so much for that, Miranda. and. Um, Noella, I, I had a sense from our conversation when I was first meeting you that, that the creative process and the art was something that was really important to you in the work you're doing in this arena. Yeah, so the story map creatings that I actually do are based off of indigenous storytellings. So a lot of the story maps that I create have traditional indigenous aspects to them, such as I talked a little bit about it earlier. I talked about how water is very, very important. Well, in indigenous standpoints, at least in the culture and community that I come from, water is sacred, which means that it holds a higher meaning than just water. Um, Basically, it means that it holds a higher property. It holds a higher value. It's medicinal, as I had said, it's healing. It holds life in itself. And so when we speak on topics such as that, you often really want to dig, dig deeper into what it is that you're really trying to talk about. So often I feel that the photos, the art itself 
the drawings, paintings, the story map, the presentation shows an adaptation in itself what you want somebody else to see. It shows a clear picture of things that you cannot say isn't happening. It's it's raw and it's real. And that basically is why story maps are so important, important to indigenous standings and indigenous history, because it shows the real raw happenings throughout time and history that allows our people to continue to grow and develop. And it also allows for the protection of nature because that's the number one, that's the number one thing here. We feel that nature is more important than anything. It gives life, it's life itself. Same with, same with water. And I love how you're speaking to the story mapping, creating this access that's not necessarily possible through looking at the scientific figures, but that there's a connection that draws people in. Um, and is relatable, that's so important. Picture holds a thousand words, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Natalia, is there anything you wanted to say? I know you're a performing artist yourself, so. Yeah, um, just like echoing um, everyone's um, amazing contributions. Um, and sort of adding off, I think this has sort of been said, but I feel at least for me, um, art is a place where I can be most honest about my emotions um, and my thoughts, and also where I'm the most receptive to um, emotions that might be uncomfortable, um, especially if they're framed as entertainment, which I don't want to say devalues the truth to them at all. Um, but I think it can be a really important gateway into starting conversations um, like we've said before, I'm like a huge musical theater nerd. Um, and uh, I've been really lucky to be able to see like themes of climate action um, come through uh, through that specific art form. And it's just been kind of so cool because it feels uh, like a really cool way to emerge um, different worlds. And like um, Noelle is saying with pictures and I also find with music, um, even if you don't necessarily connect to the content or the message necessarily, um, a melody has super strong power to stay in your head um, or resonate with you in some ways. Um, and so I think there's definitely ways we can connect and resonate with each other that is more than just actual dialogue um, and using art forms to sort of harness that um, and then lead us into a uh, dialogue can be super powerful and also just exciting um, and a cool way to sort of uh, incorporate the creative parts of ourselves um, into creative problem solving. I love what you brought up, uh, Natalia, about that access to honesty. You know, that when you are in that place, you are more likely, that's when you're the your most honest self. And, and that's certainly been my experience of, of artworks um, that are being generated by artists around the climate issue is uh, there is a vulnerability there that is so powerful um, that it 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 has connected with me in ways certainly um, that um, other forms of information on the same topic wouldn't necessarily have the same lasting impact and and have me really look differently um, at how I want to be. So I'm going to ask. One other question, and then we want to move on to our um, Q and A because I think we're getting uh, quite a few questions coming in. But just if there is any of you that want to speak to the idea of what can we do individually or collectively that you feel we can make the biggest difference. I'll I'll jump in um, and just say uh, my my usual answer to this question is um, just pick something uh, that that you can do that feels doable that feels right sized for you um, and do it and then go tell people about it. <laughs> uh, uh, 
show what you're doing, make it visible um, so that we can change the social expectations around how we're all engaging in climate action. That's great. Yes, the do it and then talk about it so that other people know, right? That it's even an option, a viable option and it's normalizing it. Others of you that you feel for you is, yeah, Natalia. I'd say like adding off of that, educate, um, but don't like gatekeep. Um, like really make sure your intention with education is to empower the other person and yourselves as opposed to it being sort of like a, hey, I'm doing this, um, like without making like a moralistic thing. Um, and adding on to that, um, yeah, just like almost like just being yourself as an activist, I find the most like inspiring, um, like Noelle was saying, like not always wanting like to approach people, letting people approach them um, or Jordan, like sometimes you just want that stake. I feel like just like showing that like uh, you can call yourself a climate activist and that doesn't mean you're any such way, you're just yourself um, that I find really inspiring um, and showing we don't have to be perfect and we forgive ourselves for that and we continue doing this work. Wonderful. I love the reference to the educating without gatekeeping. Um, others, anybody else that wants to jump in? Yeah, I'll be the one to say, of course, talk about it. So easy, but not just in the way that's like, okay, climate change is going on. The Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Like, what does this even mean? Um, but just in like tangible, normal ways too, like make it casual. I think one article or one piece that came out last year was something about like Taylor Swift and her private jet emissions. And that to a lot of climate activists may seem like, okay, what's the point of discussing this? Like we know that celebrities do this and whatever. But I found that in my conversations with my friends and people who aren't super engaged in the just climate advocacy in general, that was a very tangible way, an easy way for them to kind of share their feelings of, this is so unfair. It feels like I'm really doing my part, but no one else is. And then we're able to start a real conversation from there. So the conversations, they don't always have to be. So I guess, like, I'm trying to think, they don't always have to be so abstract and they don't always have to be so serious. It's kind of like bringing that same playful element of like, this is pop culture celebrity news, but it's related to climate change and how does that affect us as well? And that kind of just makes the whole abstract kind of problem or crisis, climate crisis, feel a little bit more down to earth, like something that we can all kind of grapple with. Fabulous. Yeah, Miranda. Yeah, I'll, I'll tag something onto that. Jo Jordan, I keep piggybacking on you. Um, well, what a pleasure it is, um, at, at least for me, um, to, to hear you talk about these questions and to, and to, and to be uh, following you. So we, one of the programs we had recently was a climate comedy night, um, just echoing points that everybody here has been making about the importance of having a whole range first of different ways that people can find pathways in to climate dialogue um, and not having all of them feel deadly serious. Um, and in fact, the comedy wasn't climate focused enough. So that became a conversation that was happening in the reception after the evening. And that itself is a form of climate conversation. So I really join with, with everybody who's, who's spoken thus far. And Noella, I look forward to hearing what you have to, to add if you, if you do have something here. Um, what, Find something that you want to take action on. It could be a consumer action or it could be a civic action. We encourage people as one example to call their banks and ask their banks to stop investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure. And we had one um, couple, it was a middle-aged straight couple that came to an exhibition and we got a note from them months later because we encourage people to think about each first small step they take as building their own learning curve and their own confidence about being a climate protagonist. We got a note back from um, the female human and this straight couple months later that said, every day we're taking new actions, turning our despair into determination. So think of what you do as something you can build on 
By talking about it with your friends and neighbors, we all have circles of trust and influence. Um, as you've been emphasizing, Kevin, and others have mentioned as well, talk about what you're doing and see it as a building block because this can be an intimidating journey to embark on. Every small step you take, it's like teaching a, a, teaching a, a niece or a nephew or a child to tie their shoes. It's a step-by-step -step process and soon it'll become automatic um, and they'll be getting fully dressed in the morning before school. So everything can be part of your learning curve. And if you adopt that kind of growth mindset and belief in your own capacity, that small steps add up to big ones, uh, you will find yourself feeling tremendously confident in less time than you could possibly imagine taking this on. It's great. Yes, the growth mindset definitely fits in here. Um, I don't want to leave you out, Noella, but I don't want you to be on the spot. Yeah, um, I I don't have much much to say. I, I'm kind of simple with this one. As when I think of in terms of getting involved in you know using your voice and everything like that, I think the most important thing to remember is do what makes you feel good, do what you enjoy, and do what you wake up in the morning and go. Oh, okay. I'm excited to talk about this. I'm excited to do this. Let's let's make a change. I I don't get involved with everything. I I don't. I work specifically with water and water quality and water being affected by climates and things such as that and pollution. And that's my main focus. I also support amongst a million other things that go on in the environment, but. I don't have a chance to talk about everything. Not everybody does. There's so much going on that it, it's hard. It's hard to feel like you have a voice and you have a purpose and what you're saying matters and that it's doing anything. It, it's very hard. I've learned that over my years of speaking. It You sometimes reach a foul crowd. Sometimes you don't always have the best outcome that you're looking for. That's not the point. The point at the end of the day is that you've done what makes you feel good. You've said your piece. You've used your power. You've used your voice in a sense. You have used the elements that you have been given when you were born and put into this world. And you reinforce it every time you talk and speak and show up. And that is all that matters. It doesn't matter to anybody else what you're doing. It doesn't matter if it makes a difference today, tomorrow, never. If it feels good and you feel good about what it is doing, keep doing it. That's the number one thing that I live by mm. is if it is doing good to you and your life, it essentially has to be doing good overall, right? Yeah, that's a great, uh, I think, message to launch into um, our, our, our somewhat we'll only get to probably a couple of these questions. Um, but I'd love to start with this one. Uh, to the younger people on the panel, what can those of us who are parents do, say, share with our children that will be impactful with our children? How do we engage them in a way that we won't turn them off? If we only address this question, I think it'll have been a really important question to bring to the table. Yeah, go for it. I would say maybe lead by example um, and sort of be that role model. Don't hold them to any standard or expectation you wouldn't hold to yourself. Um, and like we've all been saying, uh, like create a, a culture of talk um, and something that appeals to their interests um, and uh, a way to process those feelings, but also not making feel like it's a pressure, uh, it's a burden that is all on their shoulders, um, which I know is a feeling that a lot, any generation can really feel, um, but especially with the climate crisis and it's sort of being put on a uh, younger kids. So definitely making sure that it is a, a community and family effort. And like we've all been saying, uh, finding the joy um, and where you all fit in that. Yeah. yeah, something I would kind of just add on quickly 
just find something that makes it a little bit more tangible to them. Like when I was younger, just hearing messages of global warming, I was like, okay. Like I just didn't really know what that actually meant for me, um, but kind of climate change, but more so environmental justice and racism as a whole, it didn't feel real to me until I realized that that was a big reason why my younger siblings have asthma. That was probably one of the most tangible kind of, I guess, effects of environmental racism. And obviously that will go on to affect like climate change and how people experience at different times. So I think that's the first thing, making it a little bit more tangible than just like, there's some big scary monster that's coming out to get all of us on the planet and you can't see it, but it happens sometimes. Like finding that one thing and then two, finding something that they wanna save. Like whether it's a snow day, of course, or if it's something like my, one of my younger siblings like loves to kind of like garden and they're the only one in our family who does, but like they're super into it. So the rest of us try to get into it as well. Um, so just find something that works for each child. Obviously for me, that's become kind of writing in these kind of speaking events and connecting with people in that way. But know that it like looks different for everyone, but making sure one, they're comfortable with it. Two, that like it's actually real and tangible. And then three, of course, it's consistent. Um, so that kind of just goes hand in hand with making sure that it is something that they're naturally interested in, that there is something in their day-to-day -day lives that they want to protect, that they feel is important enough to protect every single day of their lives. Those are both wonderful statements. Um, Noella, anything you want to add? Yeah, um, I'm going kind of both off Jordan and Natalia a little bit. Um, I think being hands-on is a very, very very important aspect as well. Uh, not just having someone else educate you, someone else show you. It's also doing it for yourself. Um, such things as like beach cleanups. As a kid, you know, you think things like that aren't really fun. Of course, you don't think picking up trash is enjoyable. But there's the child element to it. You know, think more about the beach and nature and the environment. Don't think so much about gross trash. You have to incorporate kind of the things to children that allows them to see the good in the world. You have to put a little bit of a twist on it. Um, other examples could also be like car washes and things like that. Those are very kind of a waste of water and not environmentally sustainable in a, in a sense. Um, an easier way to kind of do things like that would be like have a, a fundraiser of some sorts where the kids kind of wash cars or something like that. It's still kind of a waste of water, but you're referring it to something else. The funding's going to something kind of more productive in the sense the youth is getting community involvement. You're deterring it from, you know, traditional businesses that use it for the wrong sorts and things like that. Uh, also with hands-on, I think of kind of allowing children to speak on an issue, like what they wanna be involved in. You can give kids all kinds of different topics and aspects and different things, but like Jordan had said, if they're not interested, they're not interested. You have to find things that they want. Let them kind of come to you. Hey, we we did this at school today, mom. This was really fun. Hey, dad, you know, I saw this video of them doing this. Can we do that? And it's as simple as that. Everyday simple aspects have to do with involvement in the climate and the environment. Your kids just have to kind of be steered in the right direction and shown the right path for their choosing. I love that you've all approached the different angles of this that all feel really important um, and and reinforce each other um, as, a, as a parent and thinking about how they can engage a kid but not be doing it for their own purposes, but have the, have the kid be um, allowing them to take the lead through, through those different uh, angles. Um, well, there have been a lot of comments and a lot of questions. Um, I, I'm gonna 
I think what I would love to just wrap with maybe one of you addressing this um, and then we'll close out, but it seems like such an important aspect is the self-care and protecting mental health. Um, so this person asks, I'm curious about the role of self-care and protecting your mental health and the mental health of those around you while doing this work. And um, so, um, does someone want to respond to that? Feel they have a, a message. Well, I'll just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Miranda. Well, well I was just going to invoke something that Natalia said, which I think is, I'm of course, not a mental health professional, um, but that I think is um, the most important. Um, you know, it's it's so scary that something like eco anxiety is like a mental health diagnosis now. Um, and that certainly wasn't a thing when I was a kid. Um, uh, and I think what Natalia said about um, focusing on what we have to gain uh, through this work um, really is so much of what's necessary for overcoming the challenges that we all face in grappling with such an existential uh, crisis. So just wanted to echo that. No, that's an excellent point. The, the opportunity, um, there is no opportunity without a crisis. I think that's an Einstein quote. And so um, there, these things open, uh, uh, there's, there's the opportunity that we may not even see, but that we can trust is part of this. Um, and, and like so many of you were saying, you know, bringing the joy, bringing what, um, what makes you get up in the morning and say, I want to do this. Um, those also feel like really important ways to address the mental health aspects of this, doesn't it? Um, so we are at the point where I would love for you to each just give like a closing remark. Um, what's something you would like to um, beam out into this, into this audience and to the other panelists that are here? Let's start with you, Jordan. Um, kind of a little bit more of an action item, I guess. Just write, like journal about how you feel, how you feel in response to this, how you feel in response to any kind of climate crisis related anything, whether it's something that your friends are doing, something that your friends aren't doing, something you wish you were doing, something that you want to do. I think getting all of your feelings out is the first step in actually processing them. Um, and then that in turn, like, a man, like Miranda was mentioning, just building that confidence in yourself so you can be the kind of climate protagonist. Um, it all kind of starts in the mind with relieving the, pre like relieving yourself of the pressure and the guilt while also not babying yourself too much. Like remind yourself, okay, I have to do something or doing something makes me feel empowered. So that's what I need to do. And just figuring that out yourself. Remember like, this is a deeply personal journey but it's not one that should be alone. Um, it shouldn't be isolating at all either. So sharing the anxieties, but also the joys and the successes that you're able to kind of, I guess, make and progress through in this journey. So yeah, I would say that's my little, comment and take away. Wonderful. How about you, Miranda? Connect with other people. Connect with other people and remember that you're part of an extraordinary species that has this incredible capacity for creativity and for moving things forward. It's a very urgent situation. Don't shy away from that. But in that lies profound meaning and possibility, just as our mortality gives the love and the loss that we feel in our lifetimes meaning, the intensity of this situation and of this challenge can provide a sense of meaning and connection that can help you move forward. So speak out and connect. Wonderful, thank you for that. How about you, Noella? My closing remark yeah, would be 
probably look within your community and around your community and see what's happening along with climate change and the environment and different changes happening, you know, new laws that have been passed, old laws that are no longer in regulation, you know, different things, pollution, just anything that you can kind of get involved in if you're interested in your community and around the neighboring communities in which you live in. I think that that would be a simple start as well as a very important addition to any environmental aspect that's happening. And every every single person's involvement matters here. It It's not a matter of, oh, well, I feel like my voice isn't very much heard and I don't feel like I'm important, so I'm not gonna have anything to do with it. Other people are already on that. It makes a huge difference. It makes a world of a difference. That one voice puts it, puts it so much farther out into the world to see that there's a you know it makes a bit it makes a better odds. It makes a better chance, and it makes a better world and environment for us. So I would I would do that. And I appreciate being here, and I appreciate everybody's conversations. It was amazing to have this experience, and I learned a lot from it. And I hope that. You know, I can continue to do these kinds of things as well. And thank you. Thank you, Noella. Uh, Kevin? Uh, ditto. We, we all have a, a role to play in saving snow days. So uh, thanks, Natalia, for leaving me with that um, mantra. And Natalia, would you like to wrap it up for us then? Sure, yeah, just echoing what everyone said, like, be honest about your feeling. It's neither good nor bad. It's just how you're feeling. And that's great. Have conversations about that. Um, like echoing, like, find what gets you excited um, and what makes you feel like you connects you to your community. Um, and just sort of like, we are, we are not, um, we are not exempt from nature. We are also a part of nature and part of this ecosystem. Um, and sort of finding that sense of belonging and also like, uh, we want to take care of this, um, cause we want to take care of ourselves and there's a lot to be gained there. Well, um, I want to close out by thanking each of you for such an extraordinary conversation and, uh, your honesty and your integrity and what you are doing, um, is so inspiring to me and uh, gives me so much hope. Um, and I am so thrilled that all these people uh, were able to be here for part of this. I wish we had had more time to engage their questions too, um, but also knowing that this recording will be available. So um, if you want to share this with other people uh, or watch it again yourself, it'll be on on Pam's YouTube channel and will be shared out to all of you um, in an email um, in the next, uh, early next week. And I'm so grateful to the Lowell Institute for helping to make this possible and to Rare for co-sponsoring and hosting um, the evening. And, um, and thanks for all the comments that people shared on the chat. Um, uh, just such rich territory. And I really appreciate that we were able to look at this from the perspective of all there is to be gained, all that we can bring to this to create a future that we want to live into and not one that we are resigned to. Um, I feel like that's an incredible place to start. And I really loved the time with all of you, both here on the panel and uh, all of you that I felt coming through the, the virtual realm. And have a great evening. And I look forward to the chance to, to be with all of you in person again, in person at some point or virtually. I'll take it either way. Thanks for being with us. Bye now. <laughs>